the paranormal event of the year is back. 40 years of taking the strange seriously, it is ASAP's 40th anniversary and it takes place at the University of Bath on the weekend of September the 3rd and 4th. It's a packed weekend of speakers, guests and live presentations, researchers and academics on the pulse of the unusual, covering the broad reach of topics under the banner of the weird and wonderful, prepared to be engaged, informed and inspired. Feel free to try your hand at the annual Paranormal Olympics, share coffee and conversation with speakers in an informal environment, meet like-minded people and celebrate ASAP's 40th anniversary. It's £20 for each day or £34.99 to cover both days. The whole weekend can be included for one simple price of £34.99 at the University of Bath, ASAP 40. Book now. And I will I'll start this with a kind of couple of disclaimers, really. Uh, in terms of now that's what I call satanic sounds, clearly this is somewhat biased in the sense that it's what I would call satanic sounds. There is weeks worth of material. So this is a brief overview. And uh, in terms of what we're actually going to cover, I've set this up so that anybody who's interested in folklore, social science, or any other kind of critical thinking approach to anomalous phenomena, has got some something on which they can buy and follow it away at, at the end of this. So obviously you can ask me questions as we go. I'm not claiming this is definitive because as I'm sure you're aware with all of these subjects, definitive is a, a university course in itself. So uh, we, we, we'll, we'll cover a lot in a very short time, but we won't cover it in a huge amount of depth. We'll cover it in enough of an insight for you to go off and have a, have a, deep dig into the things that you find most interesting you look at a couple of things which is a start point basically so on the left is a book i wrote co-wrote but the devil's jukebox and without going into all the ins and outs if any of you are familiar with john downs of uh, <clears throat> the living authority on mystery animals and various other bits and pieces um i did this book for gonzo multimedia and to be brutally honest uh it was one of the easiest books I've ever written. John, I'd, I'd done two books for them already, and John rang me at work one day and told me that he'd been out for a drink the night before, and the, a, a, a pub conversation had started along the lines of, if Satan himself had a jukebox, what hundred tracks would he have on it? At which point John decided that would be a very good book and suggested that I might be the person to write it. Um, and I, I'd have to say that was a pretty easy piece of work to do. Now, I'll tell you later on, when I say it was easy, it's stuff that I could either ask people about or stuff I would claim to know. And that's why I'm talking about this tonight. It's something I would claim to know a bit about. Um, but at the same time, when I swapped, occasionally people that didn't know much about my writing work would ask me what I was doing. I would say, I would mention the, the book that I was working on. They would say something like, oh, he's devil woman in it, which it isn't. <laughs> um, and uh, I would say, well, no. And uh, they would ask me, what's the worst record ever made? And I would say to them, you might not want to know the answer to that. So it, <laughs> you can choose to walk away now, or alternatively, you can choose to ask me again. The answers I would give them are at the end of this presentation. On the right uh, is a picture from the 1980s in the United States. These are some of the must ranks of the PMRC or the parents basically the organization led by Tipper Gore, the um, Parents Music Resource that set out to try and battle Satan in rock music. So what we're talking about here is something that's been believed for a long time. There have been various moral panics and various beliefs about satanic music or music having the power to it to convey the, the, we, the will of the devil in some way. Um, the mid-1980s eruption is probably one of the more public and one of the more um, ironically funny at times, I think I would say, because there were all sorts of things that went on around that that people who were into music found actually quite funny. Uh, but we'll talk about that in some detail. Okay. Uh, the picture on the left-hand side, again, is something that we'll touch on briefly. If you're unfamiliar with this, another 
area of moral panic and another area that's still celebrated in kind of literature about anomalous phenomena, particularly um, in terms of whether the devil actually erupted into the lives of people or not, is the black metal scene in Norway, particularly in the late 80s and early 1990s. Uh, I've put a parental advisory thing at the top of that there, but um, amongst other things, the, uh, the most extreme black metal fans in Norway around that time uh, had a habit of setting fire to churches, which was um, quite easy to do in Norway because a number of the churches that they burnt down were wooden. And there's a wonderful book about it called Lords of Chaos. I'll, I'll show you one of the closing slides, actually, is the cover of Lords of Chaos. If you're that bothered, um, I would thoroughly recommend you go and read it. It's all a bit dated, but if you want to see up close and personal documentary evidence of a, a massive moral panic around Satan and popular music, that is an absolute go-to. So let's have a talk about what we're doing tonight. So, yeah, this is a great idea for a PowerPoint, okay? But is it actually ASAP? In other words, are we looking here at anomalous phenomena scientifically studied? Um, I would say yes. And I'm, I would say that, first of all, knowing that the last time I did a presentation for yourselves on the Beatles, um, it, one, one person actually said, well, that was great, but was it ASAP? <laughs> I would say this is ASAP for a few reasons, right? And the, the bullet points are there. First of all, um, it's got the kind of things in it, the, the whole history of satanic music and the belief that Satan was involved in music has many of the kind of go-to stories that people who sit around and discuss the paranormal and eruptions of the paranormal in everyday life like to share over a drink. So it's the sort of thing I would imagine that um, one or two people will be discussing at the... Um, the ASAP conference in Bath in September. I mean, you know, the, the kind of anecdotes that we don't share. Secondly, thinking about the way that social science would see phenomena related to anomalous phenomena in general, ghosts, hauntings, whatever, the, a lot of the critical thinking, a lot of the skeptical thinking and the articles thereof often touch on various things, apophenia, which if you, I'm assuming I'm talking to the converted here, but, um, but basically the ability to see in terms of apophenia to see things in the culture and to make sense of things. Paradolia, of course, in lots of people have heard satanic messages in music, which if you listen to them carefully, often in retrospect, don't turn out to be what people claim them to be. There is a certain amount of paradolia going on where people are actually making a pattern from the random data. Uh, and some of the things we're looking at would count as psychogenic, gen, pardon me, psychogenic phenomena, i.e. basically those places where mass hysteria becomes a reality or is experienced as fact, okay? So what we, we're going to look at all those sort of things in the examples that we, uh, we cover tonight. There are one or two strange coincidences that have come up with uh, regard to popular music, cases where evil appears to be at work. We'll look at those. Um, and... Apologies for the abundance of social science, but I'd stick it out there that um, the devil is a very movable and mutable concept. And if anybody has got any hard physical data or peer reviewed evidence that the devil actually exists, please share it. <laughs> I've spent years looking for it. Uh, I can't find it. OK. So can we start with the fact that some of the things we understand of as being satanic or to do with the devil actually are provably movable and mutable um we had blasphemy laws in this country for centuries but not since 2008 and scotland 12 years later followed with that and in the last years of the blasphemy laws in the uk rather like uh, helen duncan being tried as a witch on the back of her seances with the second law uh, the understanding of what blasphemy and Satanism might mean was basically informed by test cases within the law. So certain things that were blasphemous and understood to be blasphemous a century or so before no longer are. Um, and I went looking for a dictionary definition of satanic to, towards the, to, to use towards the beginning of this presentation. And again, it... 
it doesn't actually explain anything other than saying that it's of or characteristic of Satan. But then you're going around in circles because it won't define what Satan is. So to a certain extent, satanic sounds are what we decide that they are, right? The, to, to give you an example of this, and it's not to do with music, but um, Mary Whitehouse prosecuted gay news, as you may be, or Mary Whitehouse's National Viewers and Listeners Group, prosecuted gay news in 1977. And you're unfamiliar with this, the subject of the prosecution was a poem um, which involved a, effectively a homoerotic poem in which a um, Roman soldier looks at the body of Jesus on the cross. Um, she won. It was blasphemous, according to, you know, the British law interpreted that as blasphemous. Um, but on the other hand, it probably, in terms of a legal action, did more good for gay news. It raised the profile of gay news to the point where, before that prosecution, you could not buy it over the counter in Carlisle. At the end of that prosecution, you could. Um, so whether whether it was a successful prosecution, I don't know. I mean, in, it, it to a certain extent, it achieved its aims, but on another level, it completely undermined itself by actually raising an awareness to to a level at which the people who raised the prosecution became alarmed about it all right crudely and this is the point i'm making here with regard to satanism in music um the belief about is often quite literally good for business all right and to give you an example of that there's a a brief short film i'm showing you the dvd cover on the right I wouldn't greatly recommend the movie. It's, it's pretty pretty explicit in terms of the grossness that's on offer. But the uh, the USP is that uh, you're able to buy something that was banned for 20 years on basically on the basis that it was blasphemous. There's very little these days that's beyond the pale as I'm about to show you. Okay. Let's start with the PMRC then. Parents Music Resource Center and in 1985, this organization in the United States became very concerned about the, um, the way that music was promoting un-American, but basically anti-Christian values. So much so that they, uh, they actually produced a chart called the Filthy 15. Uh, just give me a second while I uh, remind myself, but I've got a list of some of the Filthy 15. One of them there, the bottom left, you're looking at a picture of Eddie Van Halen, um, Hot for Teacher by Van Halen, <laughs> one of the filthy 15. Um, some, of, some of the other ones that you'll see, uh, Trashed by Black Sabbath, although there's any amount of stuff that Black Sabbath could have thrown in there. Dress You Up by Madonna was part of the original filthy 15 because it was explicitly sexual. And another one of those that was in there was um, Sugar Walls by um, Sheena Easton. Basically, because it's a, it, it, it's um, but it, did I say Sheena Easton? Um, Sheena Easton and Prince. He's heavily involved in that. Wow. But, but it's 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 um, you know, it, it's a gynecological ode to the pleasures of sex. Yeah. Um, now that's great, but the work that the PMRC, led by Tipper Gorwood, was doing, and also an individual who's largely forgotten now, but he was celebrated for years in fanzines. And uh, to this day, you can find his recordings all over the internet. A man called Michael Mills, who was a broadcaster who did investigations into backward masks and ranted about the evils of Satanism in music. What was wonderful about Michael Mills and was hugely amusing to particularly fans of hard rock was his utter wall-to-wall -wall ignorance i mean he would uh he, he, you can listen to his stuff to this day and i know i downloaded some recordings of his uh, various rants from um a thing called the 365 project which was put up a few years ago on the internet and it was just bizarre sound recordings that were put up every single day for 365 days basically and the thing about Michael Mills was that whilst he clearly had very strong opinions about how people like the Beatles were including backward masks in their records, the, the, the things he was citing as evidence were tropes that had often been disproven. And every once in a while, he'd really um, show himself up. And I know what, one of the more hilarious observations is that he was absolutely convinced that My Sweet Lord was a song by the Beatles. I, he didn't even seem to realise they'd split up. 
So he was that ignorant. Not surprisingly, some of the more erudite and informed people in the rock business actually had very strong opinions about what the PMRC were doing. And the quote that you've got there is literally word for word something that Frank Zappa said in, in response to their existence, um, that their, their various missives about what should be in music and their filthy 15 were collectively were an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which failed to deliver any real benefits to children, infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children and promises to keep the courts busy for years dealing with the interpretational and enforcemental problems. In other words, basically, if you were going to sue music, you hadn't got a leg to stand on, you didn't know what you were talking about, and the second this stuff came to court. Um, now, it, Frank Zappa did very well out of the existence of the PMRC. He actually insisted at one point that when the parental advisory stickers went onto albums, that the ones on his albums were bigger than other people's. Um, and he became a kind of spokesman to the point that his records started selling to much younger fans than his original fan base. So he's kind of living proof that um, a lot of what is, is presented as satanic or as evil or as potentially antisocial uh, is in the minds of, of, of people. He, the campaign against him made him more popular, okay? There is some evidence um, of various bits and pieces to do with both music theory and certain parts of the history of music that prove beyond all doubt, if this is more than folklore, there is a tradition in which certain sounds, certain ideas have become associated with Satanism and have attracted people with that kind of interest to it. Um, the Tritone, the flattened fifth, i.e. The, the basis of what's known as the Devil's Chord, which is the basis of the music of Black Sabbath, is probably, if I was looking for one example to cite, the, the best known. And one particular dictionary on music theory that I, uh, that I looked at in preparing this, this particular talk said that, that defines the sound as ominous and foreboding. Now, I don't know how many Black Sabbath fans I'm talking to here, and I don't know how many of you were watching the closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games, but uh, Tony Iommi of Black Sabbath, who, if you want evidence that it's satanic, by the way, he's a left-handed guitar player. <laughs> I've seen people cite that as evidence. Um, but he played the closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games because Black Sabbath are among Birmingham's finest and best-known musicians. If you read his autobiography, there's a fairly informed and balanced discussion of the extent to which Black Sabbath genuinely had some sense of Satanism in their music. And there are one or two things that he mentions in there that other people miss by a mile. First of all, although you can't see it particularly well in that picture, Tony Iommi is unusual among lead guitar players. He's missing the tips of his two middle fingers on his cording hand. Uh, and it's actually a a bizarre story. Black Sabbath would have sounded different, but for something that happened in the last half day of Tony Iommi's uh, career before he was in Black Sabbath. He was a sheet metal worker and he was leaving his job because Black Sabbath had decided to become professional musicians. But being a, basically a decent guy, he insisted on going in for his last half day at the, uh, the factory. His mother said to him, you don't need to go, they can't sack you. You know, what, what are they going to do if you don't turn up for your last half day? In that last half day, he lost the tips of his two middle fingers on his cording hand. He actually plays with moulded fingertips on top of the stumps of his fingers. And in his autobiography, he discusses this in some detail. The way he's managed to get, the, the only way he managed to achieve what he was achieving as a fully dexterous musician beforehand was that he altered the tension on his guitar strings he plays particular types of strings which are basically widely plays heavy gauge strings um, and subsequently his guitar sounds different to a lot of other heavy metal guitar players or it did until Black Sabbath became so popular that they became hugely influential but the sound that other people have taken as a deliberate attempt to sound like the, the, the devil is actually, <laughs> in reality, practically speaking, what Tony Iommi was obliged to do the second his professional musical career started, and it almost didn't start. 
So you can look at the things that are provably the start of a lot of belief about Satanism in music. Basically, heavy metal is the music most associated with the devil. Black Sabbath are one of the most influential bands in the early days of heavy metal. The sound and the image that they develop has been taken and just run into many different directions. So they are the granddads of everything from black metal these days to the more extreme forms of symphonic metal. But at the heart of that sound is something that occurred accidentally. All right. So this is a sort of greatest hits of music and Satanism and things that are believed. And again, if you want to go and look at some of these in detail, it's, it's all out there on the Internet. I'll just tell you what you're looking at, tell you why it's taken to matter. And my own interpretation of this is that you're just you're looking at things that might be uncanny in certain cases. But at the same time, the deeper you dig, the more you understand that this is just the way the world works. In some cases, it's a series of accidents that's just come about for reasons for variables that are way beyond the music. In other cases, it may just be that people are having a bit of innocent fun. So within all of this, then there's always been an element of music flirting with the dark side in one way or another. There's a on on the right hand side of the slide as I'm looking at it. There's a an image from a Beatles cartoon where they meet Dracula. That kind of thing's always happened. That's about as scary as Scooby Doo. In the bottom right, you're looking at the only known photograph of Blind Willie Johnson. One of the most disturbing blues songs, one song that when middle America used to refer to blues as race music and found particularly kind of uh, urban blues to be a very disturbing and powerful kind of music. One song that perplexed people because they could barely make out what it was actually dealing with was um, Dark Was The Night, Cold Was The Ground by Blind Willie Johnson. It's a song that's been covered many times since. And in, interestingly, it's also a song that's on the, the, um, the gold record that is stuck to the uh, side of the Voyager spacecraft that were launched in the mid 1970s. Um, but I would argue that in the distance between Blind Willie Johnson creating it and NASA deciding that it was such a significant work of art from Earth that it deserved to go out into space in case anybody was ever able to find it. There's a huge cultural shift. So what we're looking at in terms of things that were taken to be satanic is definitely something that will change with time and with culture. Uh, in the middle of all of this, there are one or two places where the two of them have collided head on, where the values of what might be might see itself as the moral majority have collided so hard with worries about the devil and people being a, an influence of the devil that um, they've become go-tos for you know people to study and make sense of and the two photographs to the right i'm just gonna just let me get my crib sheet so i get the names right here you're looking at uh, jay vance these are the two pictures on the right there are um jay vance and raymond belknap and you're probably familiar with the story on this the, the day before Christmas Eve in 1985, these two were listening to the Stained Class album by Judas Priest. Uh, a fair amount of soft drugs and alcohol were involved and a suicide pact was formed and uh, they decided to shoot themselves. Jay Vance survived, so I've spared you uh, the photograph of what he looked like afterwards, but the large cartoon picture is a fairly accurate depiction. Um, and you may or may not be aware of what happened after that then, but the, the whole thing ended up with uh, Vance's parents and Vance himself involved in a legal action against Judas Priest. So five years after the event in 1990, Judas Priest found themselves in court. And the claim was that um, there were satanic messages actually in the, the music of Judas Priest and specifically uh, the incitement to do it, do it, which was which was hidden in a song called Better By You, Better By Me. Um, and Judas Priest had to defend themselves on this because the claim was that Judas Priest were actually responsible for one death and one virtual death. Um, the court decided very, very quickly that Judas Priest were exonerated of all 
of all blame. And just to give you some insight into how these things take take root, Judas Priest were in court. The AOR hero in the bottom left of that slide is a guy called Gary Wright. Uh, Gary Wright was a member of the band Spooky Tooth. And if you listen to Gary Wright's solo stuff, by the mid 1970s, he was a he, he was touring with people like Peter Frampton. He was as middle of the road as uh, music came. He's significant to this little run because he's the guy that wrote Better By You, Better By Me. Um, and Judas Priest ended up in court, but they were actually arguing the toss about a song that they didn't write. And it's one of those cases that if you wanted to look into this in more detail, um, there is a, there's an academic paper called, uh, again, I'll quote this to you because it's on my crib sheet. Scientific consensus and expert testimony, lessons from the Judas Priest trial by Timothy E. Moore, uh, published in December 1996. But effectively, it's, a, it's an argument about the fact that people make their own meanings here. The Judas Priest were on trial largely because of the need of, of middle America to blame somebody. Uh, and apart from anything else, one thing that was not raised at the trial, but is highly relevant to this, Judas Priest's Stained Class is a monster selling album and it's the bedrock of a 50 year plus career in heavy metal music. Um, if you go and see Ozzy Osbourne next year at Wembley at the at the O2 rather, Judas Priest will be the support band and I'll guarantee you that a lot of people in that audience will have listened to Judas Priest for years and never thought of killing themselves. So let's talk about something else briefly then, um, at which point I'll, I'll have a big sip of tea. And if anybody's got any questions partway through, we'll talk about them as well. But if you read anything about the way that Satan works, then basically, I um, don't know how you'd put it, but, you know, <laughs> the devil will create work for idle hands. So if, if people are unwittingly there to be manipulated, it might just happen. And wherever you look in the music industry, the history of the music industry is the history of an industry that's often hugely cynical. Um, it's about exploitation and making money to a large extent. And I thought, just as an example, if we looked at one particular period of it, there are a couple of things here that you might argue um, were right for evil to manifest itself now my, my take on this would be that what i'm about to explain to you is just the way an industry works and in both of the cases i'm about to explain to you what you're actually taking on board here is the cynical need of people to to make money and to use the music industry as a means of making money but let's just go with two things that are genuinely out there and that you can check out for yourself if you're that bothered the person on the left is david cassidy David Cassidy, for all time, probably will hold one record in the history of the music business. He had more paid up fan club members of anybody at any time in any place than any other performer. At its height, his fan club was bigger than Elvis's fan club ever was. And that is saying something. David Cassidy was popular in the, 90, in the early 1970s to a degree that we would struggle to understand these days in the Internet age. Um, largely because his TV series made him hugely popular in America. He was in a, a show called The Partridge Family, which was a TV sitcom about a family that also happened to be a recording group uh, who made records. As The Partridge Family began to wane in the United States, the rest of the world took it on. So in 1972, David Cassidy was at the height of his powers. By 1974, his career was... His, teeny bopper idol career was on the wane and the plan was to try to move him to become a more adult performer but he did one world tour which, which didn't take in america but he toured australia japan and the united kingdom and the expectation was that the most loyal and loving crowds would be found in the united kingdom where he was still hugely popular um, and to end his contract with his record company which was a five album contract He'd made three studio albums. The plan was that he would make a live album and then he would make a greatest hits album. So he played three concerts in the United Kingdom. He played in Glasgow, at the White City in London. And then his final concert was at Main Road in Manchester. 
in the second of those concerts, the girl in the bottom right of the screen here, Bernadette Whelan, uh, suffered injuries in a crowd crush and died as a result of her injuries. So consequently, um, David Cassidy got a lot of very, very bad publicity and the crowd at Main Road Manchester was a fraction of what people expected it to be. Now, it didn't stop his record company releasing the live album and there is no detail on his live album about when and where the tracks were recorded. But you could guess usefully from the crowd response, the hysteria in the crowd, that it's in the UK. And there was definitely recording equipment taken to the White City. So you are listening at some point on that live album, probably to the incident in which Bernadette Whelan actually suffered fatal injuries. Um, but nobody ever mentioned that. The record made the British top 10 and it, it just helped him to end his, his contract. There's a certain irony attached to the guy on the right. I, I assume I don't need to introduce you to Gary Glitter, who the last I heard is still residing at Her Majesty's Pleasure, very close to Portland Bill. Um, and Gary Glitter is the monster that people claim him to be and is rightfully being convicted of sex crimes. But if you were looking at the, the way that evil can just manifest itself in the world, i.e. people could claim that this is, is so, Gary Glitter remains a very bankable act in the most unlikely place in America. If you were to ask any Americans about Gary Glitter, they'd, they'd know virtually nothing about his career. Technically speaking, Gary Glitter is a two-hit wonder in America. Uh, one record made the top 10, one record made number 35. There were his first two singles, at which point... His record sales in America are negligible to the point where he's virtually invisible. He's best known in America as the guy that um, co-wrote a song that was a major hit for one of their own artists, Joan Jett. But Gary Glitter makes a huge amount of money in America from the B-side of his first single. And the way this came about is just, it's just to do with the way the music industry makes money. The sound that Gary Glitter, basically the sound of Gary Glitter is a kind of tribal two drum kits. It, it's, it's a collision of rock and roll, original rock and roll, and what was possible in the 1970s with bigger sounds. Uh, that some of the secrets for the Gary Glitter sound included the fact that at the studios where they recorded his biggest hit records, there was a valve amplifier that was permanently on the blink and they managed to get a sound out of it that nobody else could reproduce. So the glitter sound, while people thought it was very high tech, was actually a complete accident. And the architect of the sound, the guy that thought about using two drum kits and great slabs of guitar was a producer called Mike Leander. Gary Glitter actually came along at the last minute. They'd already got the sound and they knew more or less what they were looking for. They just needed a jobbing singer who was out of work. And uh, Mike Leander knew that one or two people like Paul Gadd were still out there and had never really made it. He became Gary Glitter, basically. When they first recorded Gary Glitter, the first song that they recorded was done on such a cheap budget that they turned the backing track into the B-side. The backing track is nothing but claps and drum beats and a few chants. Um, and on the right, of the slide there, you're looking at the logo of the Kalamazoo Wings ice hockey team. They were one of the first sports teams in America to find this B-side and think, well, wait a minute, that is perfect music for winding up fans. So for a few decades now, the, what is known in America as the Hay Song, which most British people would know as uh, Rock and Roll Part 2, i.e. the B-side of Rock and Roll Part 1, Gary Glitter's first hit, has been a go-to to wind up fans and to wind up crowds. And to this day, it's used across the United States in utter ignorance of the story of the guy that actually recorded it, which means that huge amounts of money are still being accrued by that record. I've seen claims online that Gary Glitter's um, given away the rights to the song, but I've seen no citations that prove it. If you're unfamiliar with these, I'll, uh, I'll inflict about 10 seconds of each of them on you. Then if there's any questions, I'll take those before we move on. Right, a serious question here. Anybody got anything they want to 
add, suggest, comment on? Uh, in the chat, um, Neil, there's only a couple of questions that I've mentioned. Uh, mentions. So it might be as if you put the questions at the very end. Although okay, you, fine. Although you, although you can answer this question now if you like, but that is more of a statement. I mean, I, I put it up myself, actually. Um, so uh -huh. I listened a little while ago to um, a series of lectures by Dr. Hans Utter, and uh, he is um american uh, doctor of uh, music and he was discussing and or they, what he discovered was the amount of bands that came out of laurel canyon uh, in regards to a certain particular timbre of music a certain style uh, a note that they all used uh, all these different bands and frank zappa in fact was one of those there was like the doors fleetwood back neil young uh, mamas and papas birds and there was a fair, there's a fair a few other bands that had a very similar style of music or rather patter to their tracks and much like how we listen to rock and roll part two there and how that had a deep connection to um the cia's program um who are actually running it at the very same studio and uh, that that plays into i guess conspiratorial lines um that they believe that was effectively was put there intentionally or put out there intentionally um to change uh, the american way of life in terms of music and what they perceive to be the devil um so i, I when the fact you were talking about that i was like oh I think I'll put some information about that up into the chat box. So that okay. might. It, it, uh, I, I'm, I, the, the truth of the matter is that I don't know, and I would suggest that the person making that statement doesn't know. And what most good academics would do is line up the evidence and, and yeah. the best arguments they can and put them out there for somebody else to comment on. Um, <clears throat> my own take on the, that would be response to that. There'd be two things I'd say. First of all, in terms of where particular styles and particular sounds emerge. I think it's no accident that they often come out of live scenes. So the thing about Laurel Canyon is that you've just got people who know each other, who turn up at the same, particularly in the, at the lower end of, their, of, of the market when they're not known, they're playing the same clubs. And any study of anything psychogenic will tell you that people respond sympathetically to each other. So there's, I mean, there are academic studies, for example, that say that, um, if you watch somebody going through a range of emotions on a screen, you sympathetically do the same thing and your brain starts to pattern when it's, when it's done very effectively. Now, for better or worse, that happens among musicians all the time. And certain styles emerge that way without people really consciously thinking about it. Um, and Laurel Canyon would be a, a very good example thereof, but so would the, the drill music in the United Kingdom where yeah. a lot of the live events that, that actually brought that whole scene about you know, they're, they're full of they're, they're events brimming with anger and just basically with with, with intensity and competition. Um, the other thing about Gary Glitter, I don't think you need the devil. You simply need. You need people to behave in ways that involve them making money and you can explain virtually everything. Gary Glitter was rather like Jimmy Savile, was a person who had an alternative interest in the career that he was pursuing for very personal reasons. And there are more Jimmy Savile's out there, albeit apparently not on the same scale, thank God. There are more Gary Glitters out there. Um, and, you know, ironically then, the, the, these people are quite pliable and they're often easy to work with. If you want the ultimate irony about Gary Glitter, you shouldn't laugh, but when Gary Glitter took his computer in to be fixed at um, PC World in, in, I think it was in Bristol, the name of the guy that fixed it was Blake Gilchrist. Gary Glitter told him that there were files of a personal nature on the computer. This is 1997. Hard drives locked more easily in those days. A Gary Glitter today probably is computer literate to the point where he might not get detected. Um, Blake Gilchrist assumed that there were confidential financial files, yeah, but that when he unlocked the computer and saw what he was looking at, he was so shaken he went outside for a smoke. At that point, he ended a career, and here's the irony, Gary Glitter at that point was one of the most bankable acts on the road. Now you can see Satanism in this because he was so dependable, he got to so many people. But the ultimate, ultimate irony about Gary Glitter is that the reason he was bankable was that he was playing venues that could guarantee to sell out with him one year after the next. So he was playing like 3,000 seater venues, places like Brentwood Arena or somewhere like that. And the way the business worked is that if those venues knew that they could sell out year on year, they'll just book the same act. So often a Gary Glitter gig would be 
either preceded or immediately followed by his management striking a deal with the venue on exactly the same terms with the following year. And the reason they knew that Gary Glitty could sell those tickets is that more than any act of his generation, he was a family entertainer. Can you get your head around this? Um, Gary Glitter was very keen on playing his greatest hits and turning the show into a pantomime. And on the surface, it just looked like, um, you know, he was the ultimate showman and that's what he liked doing. Of course, it's blatantly obvious in retrospect that more than other people, he was bothered about attracting a, a, an audience that continued to have very young people in it. So he got older whereas some of his contemporaries were often more bothered about being taken seriously as musicians and were more concerned about what their next album would sound like. Um, Gary Glitter was the ultimate family act. People took their kids, and in some cases, three generations of the same family went along, which is why he was so bankable until the day he was arrested. Now, you could see the hand of Satan in that. Alternatively, you could see an opportunist in the middle of all of that and everybody else just thriving on the business and not really questioning the man at the center of it because the second if you've got any doubts about him the second you call those doubts out you've probably put yourself out of work as well i don't think you need to explain his success down to satan basically um i think it's something that happens all the time Oops, sorry right when i wrote the devil's jukebox so uh, one or two people that i met in the course of doing that book or writing another book on the weirdest albums ever made would ask me like things like well you know will someone so be in it um will, will devil woman be in it no <laughs> um but here's another kind of if the devil has an enemy in the music business and i seriously don't think that he has but here's an uncanny thing that i've seen quoted almost like satan at work um I'm assuming I don't need to introduce Cliff Richard to anybody who's looking in tonight, yeah? We are familiar with who Cliff Richard is, yes? That would be a fair, a fair guess. A friend of a friend stuff, so I can't tell you that what I'm about to say here is absolute gospel, and I wouldn't want to write it down the way that I'm explaining it, but Cliff Richard was on EMI records for 40 years, from 1958 to 1998. Um, he remains one of the most successful British artists of all time, more weeks in the chart than any other British artist, yada, yada. But I've spent a lot of time writing about music, and more recently I've got a radio show where people send me free music. So I've dealt with PR companies for decades. Um, and I heard the same story from a few people, that a lot of artists ring up the marketing department of their record company and ask why the hell the records aren't higher in the charts, et cetera, et cetera. One of the most notorious was Cliff Richard. I heard from a couple of people that he was hugely unpopular at EMI for doing that very thing, that if his records weren't doing particularly well, he would blame the people selling them rather than himself. Um, and if you look at Cliff Richard, he was because he's not taken very seriously as an artist, he's often indicated in interviews that he should be regarded highly because of the level of his success, i.e. the weeks he spent on the charts and stuff. And up until the mid-1970s, he was talking, he was proud of a record, of having had a hit record in every year since the start of his career, but he did not have a top 40 single in 1975. <clears throat> and that's because at that point he was struggling anyway and his record company had decided that the way that he was going to have hit singles was to move to be a more adult artist <clears throat> and what they did was that they started getting songs from the united states that were doing well out there and cliff started covering them and it went reasonably well um not hugely well but in 1975 he covered a song called honky tonk angel and actually performed it on the british tv show supersonic and that was going to be his big stab at a hit single. And he was very precious about having had a hit single every year since 1958. Unfortunately, um, just as Honky Tonk Angel was going into the shops, it was pointed out to Cliff that he completely misunderstood the song. It's actually a song in praise of a prostitute. For, uh, and the, the, the gist of the song is that there's a guy whose life is sometimes very difficult, but however bad it gets, there's a certain prostitute he can go to for comfort. The guy that wrote the song is Conway Twitty on the left hand side. Consequently, Cliff Richard's record was withdrawn and he did not have a hit record in 1975. Now, again, 
I see the hand of fate there and people desperately trying to make money um, and misjudging something. But you could read that if the devil wanted to bring anybody down, it's Cliff Richard. And that would be the instance when it happened, because he's unbroken a record of which he was very proud, a chart record of which he was very proud when that day. Right. Um, and he had no hit singles that year. Right. Let's just take a complete swerve here. I'll play you a couple of tracks. You'll see the lyrics on the left hand side and then we'll have a talk about something else about the devil in music. Sniffing dead birds, suicide, rotting hedgehogs and semen, Sam sucked on a hedgehog with spiny teeth, unused condoms, used in a jar, pinnacle onion taste. <laughs> So in terms of what you might call satanic music, if we move forward a few decades from the PMRC who are concerned that America's youth is being corrupted by the likes of Bon Jovi, and we move to the age of file sharing and we move to what we have these days, if you're unfamiliar with this, for example, um, sites like SoundCloud and in particular Bandcamp are now go-tos you can make any sound you want and load it up on Bandcamp. Um, you can give it away for free. You can decide how much you're charging people for it. And one thing that has changed people's notions of, if you like, the, the moral panic about music is kind of has declined recently to the point where people are much more bothered about other things, things like you know, whether computer games are going to turn people into violent criminals or whatever. Keeping it really simple, any sociologist would tell you that people are invested in a campaign when they feel that they have agency in it, when they feel that they can make a difference. These days, there are people concerned about the satanic influence of music, but you'll find them in little niche areas all over the place. You won't find a mass campaign because to a certain extent, the battle has been lost. And it's been lost because of the existence of the stuff that you're looking at now. Uh, as independent records became cheaper and cheaper to make, i.e. basically as the digital technologies that, that now drive the music industry became widely available, one or two people were able to make money on the back of sales that would have been just catastrophic for the generations before them. And to give you some examples of these then, the Uncalled Four, and that's Donna Rose of the Uncalled Four, by the way, the, uh, the, the musician that you can see there. Um, the Uncalled Four are not what they claim to be. They claim to be a punk band from the late 1970s. Actually, they're not quite the animals that they claim to be. And they made their record, which they claimed was older in, in the mid 1980s. That said, if you haven't sussed it already, it's blatantly a song in praise of Ed Gein. Um, and it's one of a number of rock songs that are dedicated to Ed Gein, who's not. Are there any experts on serial killers out there? You need to have killed three people, don't you, to be a serial killer, or, or am I wrong about that? Somebody come back to me? I saw Dave Sevier put up his uh, hand on what said three. So I Sorry? Think was, I, th I saw Dave Sevier say three, so I think you're right. right yeah, okay. So... <laughs> Ed Gein is on the borderline, definitely killed too. Whether he killed his brother in a forest fire is disputable and we'll never know it. So he may not be a serial killer, but he's a hugely influential figure. And if you're unfamiliar with Ed Gein, he's worth a Google. But basically the uncalled for stuck a record out in praise of Ed Gein in 1985 and claimed it was an older record. And my argument would be that they are contemporaneous with the PMRC. They're the reason the PMRC failed. It's them and people like them. If the cheap technology that was then becoming widely available in the 80s meant that anybody could record anything, however atrocious, and just wallow in the filth, then the PMRC and the moral majority did not any longer have the agency to stop this stuff. Um, you move forward a few decades to band camp, and this is fairly recent, but um, I, I'm, I've played this lot on my radio show and I absolutely love transvestite stallion. I haven't a, a clue what the hell they are. You know, they're, they're just, they, these, are, these are basically sound artists who 
just play around with the surreal to the point where it's very difficult to know what it is that they're on about, other than that they're, they're clearly they're clearly cultish and they're not celebrating mainstream values. And there is any amount of this stuff out there, right? So you know, call yourselves rectal smegma and just put your record out and just just grab a porn shop for your cover. It's no wonder the moral majority have moved on to targets where they feel they can make a difference because they. You know, as David Bowie once said about music, that um, the internet had made it as widely available as water. So consequently, um, you know, the, the world in which he grew up had changed beyond all recognition when he, when he died. And if you're not aware of it, Prince Andrew is a sweaty nonce, which opens with the glorious line, something like the Grand Old Duke of York. Uh, he said he didn't sweat. So why did he pay 12 million quid to a woman he'd never met? That was number 20 on the week of the Jubilee, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, how, how you, you just, you, you can't stop these people now. The, you know, the, basically the, the internet is their oyster and you don't even need to be a musician to stick the stuff out there, right? If, if the devil is at work, that's a playground that, that he could thrive in. And more to the point, people willfully do the most outrageous things on the internet in the hope of selling a few records. And my guess is on the odd occasion that I rock up there and buy them, they never imagined me or anybody like me as a fan, but it's, it, there's a market out there. Okay, Great. we'll move on then. So there are a number of people who for one reason or another, incidentally, we are familiar with um, George King on the right. I'm not claiming him as a rock star. We'll come to him in a second. If you're unfamiliar with him, that's the guy that founded the Aetherius Society. But the, the two on the left, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people will recognise Alistair Crowley and Anton LaVey. One point I'd make about both of them, and this is, I think, significant to any notion that Satanism is alive and well in the music industry or ever was. The people who become the heroes in these circumstances often come from a background where what they do and the way they behave is informed by things that are not satanic. Now, I'm not saying that Alistair Crowley and uh, Anton LaVey were fakers in any large extent, but what I'm saying is that if you look at the backgrounds, Alistair Crowley was, you know, public school, English, rock climbing, whatever. Um, his particular take on Satanism and his, you know, his do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law and the, the writings that he produced and indeed the way that he informed certain rock bands are very much just part of a kind of cultural tradition where people take what they've, they, they grow up with and adapt it to the needs of a particular market. I'm not saying that Crowley was in, sincere in doing so, but I'm saying that the more you look at his work, the more you see the kind of values of the public school and the England in which he grew up, and the more you see that he aspires to do the things that other people do just in very different ways. So Crowley is a writer uh, from a generation when the most revered public academics were often people who wrote novels and wrote novels challenging something about the status quo. He's crudely, um, he's a bit younger than the Bloomsbury group and other people who were cultural outliers. And I think these days they'd be filmmakers, they'd work on the internet, they'd be musicians. Um, Anton LaVey, interestingly, and I don't want to go into all of this, but whilst he was a practicing Satanist and celebrated as one of the most significant Satanists in the United States, certainly active in the 1960s and 70s, um, if you actually listen to his albums, and I'm not going to inflict any of it on you now, but I have inflicted it on my, my listening public over the years, um, it's very showbiz, you know, he's, you've only got to listen to the way the albums are put together and the way that he delivers his songs. He's certainly informed by stage musicals. And one thing Anton LaVey did not do in any large amount was produce ear splitting satanic rock music. Actually, it's completely different to that. Um, he was celebrated as a kind of, I don't know quite how you'd look at it these days, but he, he was, he was a, both an, outsider but at the same time somebody who the american press the american tabloid press of his of his generation uh, would go to for quotes and would always be uh, discussing what he did my argument 
and the reason that George King is there is that actually, if you look at the way that these people behave, and if you look at how they make themselves significant, there's not a lot of difference actually between those people and some of the other figures that we know in the in anomalous phenomena and the paranormal in general. If you're unfamiliar with George King, well, he's the head of the he was the head of the Ethereum Society. He founded his own religion. Uh, his religion, the cosmology of his religion, collides some of the Christianity and some of the teachings of the Bible with a kind of sci-fi aspect where Earth is the least significant planet in terms of the intelligence on it in, in our solar system, that beings of a higher vibrational rate and greater intelligence inhabit the other ones and they can be contacted. And one of the conduits through which they were contacted whilst George King was alive was King himself. So the Ethereum Society presents King in the tradition that also includes Jesus and the Buddha. Um, if, if you read Flying Sorcery by David Clark and Andy Roberts, they, they see it another way, that he was a taxi driver who almost set out to become this character and, and the whole thing was to a certain extent. According to one story, um, he once asked at a meeting how, how he became a millionaire and somebody told him to start a religion. Um, <laughs> David Clark found one person who claimed to have seen that happen, but it, it, you can't prove it. But the point I'm making, if you like, is that I would say that a lot of the most significant figures who have taken Satanism as a badge by which they became known are only behaving in ways similar to other characters that we'd see who don't become satanic, right? <clears throat> Let's have a look at, so, just let me put my glasses on here, but this is the extreme end of black metal. So at, at this point, I, I don't think I need to warn anybody too much about what's going on, but uh, the, the, the presentation from here on in, there'll be one or two things that people might find a little bit upsetting. So I'll, I'll give you trigger warnings when I think we, we need them. But basically at the moment, you're looking at a few things here. The uh, Perhaps the easiest one to describe to you, if you're looking at the, the guy in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. So... Glenn, Be excuse me, just give me a I'm about to start coughing. <clears throat> Glenn Benton, who is the uh, the guitar player and the leader of the band Deicide. So De Deicide are one of a number of bands that, if you were to go and look for rock bands, metal bands, that claim to to have Satanism at the heart of what they do, then Deicide are one of those. And the uh, what you see the the inverted cross in um, Glenn Benton's forehead is there permanently. It, it, it's part of, of what he presents and what, what Deicide uses there. It's iconic among Deicide fans, basically. Um, and there are a number of bands, probably in the, the, in the UK, the best known are the band Venom, who, who've been one of, the, one of the first sort of black metal, satanic metal bands that this country produced, and they're still a going concern. But in different countries, different cultures, the, um, the interpretation thereof has been slightly different. And without going into all the details, in crudely, in Norway, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the black metal scene became so empowered in terms of its, its sense of battling for on, on behalf of Satan and also attaching itself to some of the same pagan god ideals that have been part of Nordic culture for a long, long time. Uh, in the middle of all of this, there was a rivalry developing between the most extreme bands, and the, the two that you're looking at here, Wagby um, Kearns, who was the, the leader of the band Burzum, uh, was basically a rival of the, um, the band Mayhem, or at the top there, Mayhem had one character in the band who called himself Dead. And crudely, what you're looking at then, the, the, uh, the, the two people in Mayhem here, Dead, uh, i.e. the guy, the taller of the two people in the, the picture of Mayhem, committed suicide. His friend was murdered by Varg Vikens from Burzum, and in the competition to become the greatest Satanists, 
it went way beyond church burning to the point where actually the lead singer of one band murdered a member of another band, at which point, to a large extent, the, the discussion about who were the biggest Satanists went beyond the music and, and you know, enacted itself in, in satanic acts that, that actually ended up with some, one person dead and one person in jail. And along the way, uh, suicide was not unknown among those musicians and it became part of the culture. Now, that doesn't mean that these people were necessarily driven by Satan. Um, and at the same time, the people who've written about the scene describe it almost like... Um, Like, 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 like the, the, the way that people who would have a moral panic about it would imagine a worse nightmare to be. Just, just, just people acting out to a level at which they were winding each other up. The truth of the matter is that um, it died down fairly quickly after that, but not before a, a lot of churches had been burned and not before the music that they made had become cultish to the point where now these days you can hear their children basically out there making <clears throat> making music that's clearly informed by that and if we go back to band camp and places like that of course these days the music is available around the world uh, and you can find people like in Iran that will be making black metal where to do so is actually endangering their liberty but it doesn't stop them doing it okay so <sighs> When I was writing the Devil's Jukebox book, uh, people were asking me, what, what's the worst record ever made? So this is bubbling under. The next two, which I would argue are the, the competitors for number one, are probably the ones that you, you might find most disturbing if you're easily offended by anything. But whether, I don't know if you, how many people listen to this are aware of this, but Charles Manson, i.e. the hippie cult leader, as, as he was caricatured in America, um, was a recording artist. In fact, it, interestingly, Charles Manson, uh, had he not masterminded mass murder and uh, led his cult, might conceivably have been a, a cultish musician. He, amongst other things, bizarrely, when the um, Variety magazine, the, the magazine of the entertainment industry in America, had a call out for people in 1966 who were going to form a, a band that were going to be on a TV series, i.e. basically the band that became the Monkees and uh, whose template was the, the first two Beatles movies, particularly the second movie. Charles Manson turned up an audition. Um, uh, I'm not sure that he'd have made, he'd have, he'd have made it into the Monkees. He was uh, dismissed very quickly, but he was around the music scene in California in the 1960s. Um, and amongst other people met Neil Young and without going into the, the Manson crimes, um, some of what drove him was his own anger at the people who he saw had turned him down as a musician and had uh, thwarted his ambitions, including a guy called Terry Melcher, who was the, a record producer, big mates with the Beach Boys and was the son of Doris Day. Uh, and to this day, you can buy Charles Manson's records. And I'm not joking. Charles Manson was in San Quentin. So he actually made, he, he recorded more songs in San Quentin than Johnny Cash ever did. And it's not a bad album. It's very lo-fi, but he had a certain instinctive talent. If you're easily triggered, uh, be aware that the next two things were my answer. When, when, when people ask me, well, what's the, what's the most evil record ever made? Uh, I really can't decide between two. So these are joint number one that are coming up. All right. First of all, this, um, if you're unfamiliar with this, if genuine evil exists on record, then my argument would be that it, it, it's there because there are things that we understand as evil and very, very disturbing in life, and you can find ways of presenting them. Peter Sotos, who's the guy on the right, S-O-T-O-S, if you want to give it a Google afterwards and you're unfamiliar with it, made an album called Buyer's Market. Buyer's Market purports to be a serious artist investigating the way that sexuality and sex crimes are actually experienced in life. Well, that's all well and good, but what you actually hear on the album are 
sound recordings of people who've been affected by sex crimes or who've committed them, i.e. law enforcers, victims, families. Uh, and it's presented as a, a work of art. In other words, he's assuming the shtick on this is that um, the audience is intelligent enough to understand it for what it is. Therefore, they won't blame him. Therefore, it can't possibly be pornographic or exploitative. Fundamentally, it's a work of art. Now, maybe uh, it's not a very easy listen. Uh, and if you want to hear something that is utterly disturbing, this thing is out there and it's not that hard to find. Um, and again, just let me remind myself of something because I can... I was talking to an artist, mate, about this about three weeks ago, and he said, well, you've got to mention a, an artwork. And I was unaware of this, but um, again, something you might want to Google, just to put Peter Sotos in context. This actually happened in 1972, but Vito Aconci's seabed, uh, seedbed rather, which was a work of art. If you Google it, it was a huge installation in art galleries. So the, the Tate website has it, but the, the original seed bed was actually displayed in New York. And amongst other things, there was a large gallery space given over to artwork, but the artist himself was hidden under a ramp in the gallery um, and was, according to what I've read on the Tate website, was was masturbating and at the same time was talking into a microphone and his stream of consciousness fantasies about the people that were walking over him on the ramp were being broadcast live to the gallery as he was doing it. Now, part of me thinks, well, that's a pretty extreme artwork. And part of me thinks, well, if that artwork is open for three weeks, doesn't the novelty wear off under that ramp very, very quickly? Um, but the point I'm making is that Peter Sotos' work is in a great artistic tradition. I think you would struggle to get Seedbed or Buyer's Market approved as works of art these days if you were looking for funding. I think they're very much of their time. But on the other hand, if evil exists in recorded work, it's in something like this, where the excuse that puts it together doesn't really do all the work to mitigate the work that's actually out there and the potential of that to cause serious disturbance to other people, right? If it has a rival as the most evil record ever made, i.e. The, the record that contains the most evil, it's probably this. Um, I got a review copy of this. It was <laughs> and actually at a paranormal conference. I was at an unconvention in, I don't know, I forget which one it was, but back in the days when I was also writing for kind of cultural magazines and stuff like that on a regular basis before the internet took it all over. Um, and I remember there was a representative of the Grey Matter record label there that was actually selling CDs and, and he gave me one copy of everything that he had on his store. If you haven't sussed this, it, it's pretty straightforward. It's a double CD when you buy it, uh, the People's Temple Choir, he's able. Um, so one, of the CDs is a pretty straightforward, if fairly pedestrian gospel album, spirited in places, but a bit kind of one dimensional in the production side of it. But the other CD is what you would think from looking at that picture. It is, if you remember the um, Jim Jones and his followers committed mass suicide in Guyana in 1978. Well, at the time they were doing it, without going into all the details, he was telling his followers that they were doing a thing, they were committing revolutionary suicide, i.e. because the forces of law enforcement had followed them from the United States and they were about to be repatriated and Jones was going to be prosecuted. Um, what they were going to do instead was that they were going to commit suicide and be reincarnated together in a better place. Therefore, as he was preaching his final sermon, there was cyanide laced flavor aid being given out and it started with giving it to little babies so i.e parents literally killed their own children at which point mass suicide broke out but underneath the um the lectern as, as jim jones was preaching his final sermon was a voice activated tape recorder so you can actually buy an album of his final sermon and the, the tape runs out mercifully, not long after he's finished talking, but not before you can clearly hear in low fi but unmistakably, you can hear people screaming as they die. Um, again, <laughs> there may be 
a reason for him to record that. It was somebody else's decision to stick it out as a CD. Whether that is a document of genuine historical worth or whether somebody just chanced upon the recording and decided to stick it out, uh, I think he's very much in the ear of the beholder. Right. Just a, a little bit of critical thinking to uh, bring some light relief from those two fairly ghastly examples there then. A point I make in the Devil's Jukebox and something I've argued to people when they talk about satanic music. If evil or an evil being akin to the devil actually exists, why the hell would he need our worst efforts? Surely he has powers above and beyond humanity and he can do things that we can only imagine. What you're looking at here, Stevie Wonder's um, The Little Known Song I Can't See Shit, Rolf Harris's cover of The Man With The Child In His Eyes, or uh, My Lips Are For Blowing, uh, the, the infamous Woodwind album. I'm assuming you might have sussed this already, but none of these things actually exist. They're all memes. Uh, and in the, in the age of the internet, there is any amount of this stuff out there. There are, there, there are a couple of Facebook pages dedicated to albums that will never be made but which have, have got a certain ironic kind of humor about them the point i'm making is that it would be within the power of a godlike being to create this stuff therefore why the hell would they need any of the things that i've just shown you okay almost done with this just a, a few cheerful pointers before we take any questions then I'm saying don't have nightmares. Somebody who helped me with the, um, the Devil's Jukebox book is the charming young lady on the right. And she is, actually. Um, when she models, she's called Miss Kitty Grimm, and Grimm like in the Grimm's fairy tales. Uh, but I had the, the genuine pleasure of teaching her for two years as a, as a professional writing student. Um, she's very quiet and studious and polite in the room. Um, nothing like that at all. But one thing that we swapped when we weren't busy trying to get her qualified and, and you know, kickstart her writing career, one thing we spent time discussing was the music of Cradle of Filth, which she absolutely loves. But she continues to be a professional bookseller and aspiring novelist. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, no amount of listening to Cradle of Filth has, uh, has turned her into the monster that she portrayed when she used to be a model. Um, so... <laughs> Number one, the, the worst music that people will warn you about has people out there listening to it, and most of them don't do anything other than listen to it and quite enjoy themselves. And secondly, in terms of don't have nightmares, the, uh, most of the churches that burnt down in Norway have, have been rebuilt. The church that was on fire in the earlier shots is the one you're looking at there. Okay, and just before we take any questions, if you are that interested in anything that I've said and you want to do a deeper dive, I would thoroughly recommend the three books that you're looking at. Clearly, there may be a certain amount of bias in self-interest in me recommending the one on the left-hand side. Uh, the other two take as absolutely gripping and very insightful reads. Both a bit dated, but Lords of Chaos is a deep dive into the most satanic outbreak of dark metal music anywhere anytime on earth it's more like um a piece of good investigative journalism than a genuine exposure of uh, anything truly satanic but you get a sense of the people who were there why they did what they did what actually happened and this is up to and including the uh, the spat between mayhem and burzum the two bands which uh, resulted in one suicide one life sentence and one murder uh and as a sort of digest of all satanic sounds from metallic to the likes of Anton LaVey and some sense of how each informs the other and how it became a, a kind of subculture in its own right or a number of subcultures. Lucifer Rising, although it's a little bit dated now, is a very good primer for a lot of the things I've been talking about. Okay, any questions? Uh, Neil, thank you very much for an interesting, fascinating conversation there. I'm sure many of us will now perhaps have nightmares tonight as they think about these things. When they've done this. <laughs> oh, well, these things could happen, I guess. I'm um, CJ, I'm aware, is in the room next door trying to keep cool 
and because uh, at the temperature that is in his room is, is too hot. So I'll take over the um, presentation as as we talk here. So I was going to say the, the the chat, but the chat is generally it's been pretty smooth tonight. Not so many uh, questions as such. There's, there's some statements about some of the things you've said or they've made comments as, as we've gone. So if um, I'll, I'll run back through them from the beginning. So okay. That'll be, I thought it was a good uh, point of reference here. So um, Max Chamberlain here says, I'm up for being involved so in Brighton. I think that was involved regarding the ASAP um, regional sections. So the word Satan is Hebrew for adversary or the accuser. Um, mm -hmm. are, are you aware of that? Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I, I should probably actually my, my bad on that one. I should probably have addressed that when I when I just went for the more broad dictionary definition. Um, we, I suppose, the comment I'd make is this: that there are notions of Satan, um, and there is a concept of what Satan may be. But wherever you go and whatever time you choose, that is something, as I, I think the word I used earlier on was mutable, and I'd go with that, yeah. It's adversarial to the good, basically, which is why the PMRC took exception to rock music and why these days they're more bothered, their moral majority, like in America, are more bothered in, they're bothered in general culture wars these days, so... <laughs> You know, the, the music of people like Frank Zappa seems to, to concern them less than, than people who claim that climate change is real. Yeah, there's, there's a follow-up point here. So I happen to be listening to Black Sabbath just before joining the meeting here. Pure coincidence, probably. Could have been influenced. Um, Maybe. If, if anybody... I, I've got a very good friend who's a disfellowship Jehovah's Witness. And once randomly, um, when they knocked on my door, there's a there's a wall of CDs. If you open my front door, there's a wall of CDs on one side of the hallway. Um, and for want of anything better to say, I turned around and said, what, well, I've got to give up Black Sabbath and Napalm Death and kind of pointed at the relevant CDs. Uh, and there was a moment of complete dumbfoundedness on their part. They didn't know what to say. <laughs> and uh, I ended up closing the door very politely saying thanks, but no thanks. And uh, I spoke to my disfellowship friend and she said, well, you know what? When they prepared me to knock on doors, there was never any preparation for that. So Black Sabbath serve a number of uses. <laughs> That's great. Uh, serial killers often involve uh, a ritual around the killing, the saint of a behaviour. So you can be a multiple murderer, but not a serial killer. I think that was regards to the fact that I think it's something to be three. Oh, Ed Gein, yeah. So he, he, Ed Gein, I think, is a really interesting case. He's more rock and roll than most of the serial killers because there is a certain surreal artistic element to his greatest work. Um, so consequently, I mean, he, I'm assuming most people are aware of this, but 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 Gein is a hugely influential figure in cinema because without him, we probably wouldn't have the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, Silence of the Lambs, or Psycho, all of which are in their own way kind of seminal movies. So he's a hugely powerful figure. It's just that he's a, technically speaking, you can't prove he was a serial killer, but he's he's a very rock and roll figure. There's lot. Ed Gein has influenced a lot of rock music. There was even a band called Ed Gein's Car. He continues to be celebrated, and long after his death, he's he's coming up 40 years dead in two years, isn't it? There'll doubtless be something about it. And, you know, he's still he's still cool. He's still down with the kids. Yeah, the music of that time, it, it appears to have a resonance that um, you can still feel today, and the music sounds really fresh and still, uh, whenever you listen to it. Mm. I, I, I think I made a comment to something you said that... Um, I worked for Scientology. I was thinking about L. Ron Hubbard, of course, started his own religion, <laughs> um, basically to uh, as a way to avoid tax. And, well, yeah, but so, so it's interesting. Hubbard and um, George King, circumstantially speaking, have quite a bit in common. And I probably, maybe I didn't explain it as well as I could, but I, I think there's, I think they're products of their generation to a certain extent. And I think that... Um, I think there's more common ground between Alistair Crowley and George King. If, if, if you regard them as um, very ambitious expressions of what they want to be, they've, they've pursued their own ambitions in their own way, but actually the cultural values that have informed the way they've gone about that are very much from the time and place in which they grew up. So for better or worse, King's a London taxi driver who was capable of communicating with virtually anybody and fair play to him, 
his the two things that have made his religion a success if you stand back and assume for one second that it may not be what it claims to be i.e he never really spoke to aliens and saved the planet um number one it's it's a very positive religion it gives you an instant positive message um and number two whatever else you think about him the man was a grafter beyond all else you know he was um he worked tirelessly to build the whole thing up and uh <laughs> Hubbard to a certain extent you know was maybe more self-centered but it was the same thing oh for sure um Dave Sevilla says uh Sotos also published a small press magazine uh talking about how he wanted to murder children yeah so who said that uh Dave Sevilla is he still in the room he is yeah uh Dave I ask, I ask him ask him if he would have a beer with Peter Sotos no, I wouldn't. Uh, I got yeah. So that's interesting, isn't it? W w would you have a beer with Jim Jones? Definitely. Not, you know, not all the stuff about the Kool Aid. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I mean, I've, I'm not sure how I, I was charged with writing two books about the most extreme music that was out there or, or similar basically sound recordings that were out there and Peter Sotos is unavoidable because I can see how he went about it and you're you're absolutely right and I would argue crudely he's a product of his time in the age of the internet him or, a, or an artwork like Seedbed I mean can you imagine going to a gallery these days and saying, well, we'll build a ramp and I'll lie under it and, you know, I will commit like acts of sexual self-abuse while people are walking over me. I I can't see people granting you money for that now. It, it You know, it, it's very much of its time, isn't it? Very much. I mean, it's very 90s. I mean, there was a lot of that in um, Private Eyes Huge's Corner at one time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean... It, I mean, amongst other, I mean, amongst other abominations, there was a, a, a film called The Fall of Communism in Eastern Europe. Right. As, as shown through gay porn. Oh, <laughs> how the hell have uh, I got to age without knowing that exists? <laughs> and I mean, this is, this is if I remember correctly, and what it is, is a series of naked blokes' bums being felt up by a male hand. And Not that's really. it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, oh, I mean, there's, there's, there's any number of stuff. I know, and of course, this, you know, I think about this time, you had Stellark um, sitting in an art gallery for a week with his mouth and his eyes sewn up, so. Yeah, I know. And, I'm not sure what motivates people to do that. I think wherever you go, you will find the most extreme, bizarre, random acts of certain things going on. As hindsight will subsequently, you know, recognize some. So, for example, you know, psychoanalytic literary criticism without going too far down there. I've seen various critiques of certain writers which would suggest that there were things you know, they, personality disorders or in certain cases autistic spectrum diagnosable conditions where nobody at the time would have recognized it and you look at the work and you say well actually that makes sense now also the kind of cultural circumstances that produce these various th these celebrated cultish items that you th that we're talking about tonight you know, there are so many variables in there. I mean, we've come a long way from satanic music, but the point I would make is that the more you look, the more you see that certain variables at certain times help create the work, and I don't see one consistently evil hand behind it, yeah? And, I mean, I'll, I'll bow to your greater knowledge of the fall of communism through gay porn. It's not something I know a great deal about, but th there's a serious argument behind that then, that if you actually look at how this became a thing in communist society, you see the values of the whole thing eroding from within, I take it, yeah? Yeah. 
Fair enough. There's, there's... Yeah. No, I no, I agree with you. Yeah. Um I though I mean I think the fall of communism through gay port in East New York through gay port, and I think that was staged one of the British galleries. I mean it was Oh really? I I'm not sure whether it was something that that actually came from that actually came from Eastern Europe. But it might be. I mean I don't I don't know. I, and I just read the snippet about it in um it, in private eye. Yeah, if you're at the Seriously Strange weekend, I think we should probably investigate that. I'd love to have that chat over a beer at some point. That's that, that's a whole that, that's that's something I don't know about, but it's so relevant to what I've just been talking about tonight. I feel I should know it. Um, I, I, I'll go away and make it my business to find that out and uh, hold an intelligent conversation in a few weeks' time. Okay. Yep. Uh-huh. What was that? It? Look forward to it. Yeah. I, again, there's not exactly a, uh, a question here, but um, I pulled up something from my own archive that I wrote back a, a few, well, about 2017, I think I wrote this. Uh, there was an article uh, in GQ magazine by Billy Ray Cyrus, and he was talking about that he believed that there was uh, the devil, or rather, he actually explicitly used the word Satan. He says, my family is under attack by Satan. I'm scared for my daughter, Miley. And that was prior to her um, leaving uh, Hannah Montana to become a, a music star in her own right. So no, so it's 2013. Sorry, um, and there's, there's some interesting examples of uh, music artists who claim to be possessed on stage. Uh, Nicki, Mizar- Nicki Minaj says she has eight different personalities to take over her when she's on stage. Uh, Beyonce claimed that she um, went through rituals before she became famous, and when she's on stage, she, it's another entity that takes over her called Sasha Fierce. I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's and various other artists who say something very similar. They went through ritual practice before they became famous and they effectively sold their soul to their, their art. Uh, Lady yeah, Gaga, so Keisha, Rihanna. The, 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 the critical thinker in me would immediately spring back with two retorts to that one, Christian. The first one is that those are great stories, but they're all self-reported. Yes. Um, secondly, that there are loads of examples of people who've invoked all sorts of powers to try and make themselves famous or successful and have failed <laughs> right um not least of which probably would be some of the hangers on in the norwegian black metal scene um so we celebrate mayhem and burzum but burzum let's just park the whole death metal thing for a bit there is some of their music um in fact the 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 two albums that that varg made in jail are stark compelling and kind of gloriously disturbing there's this he's it's a shame about the murders and the life sentence because he has genuine talent as a musician um but there's loads of examples of people who went in the same direction or tried to invoke certain powers and you'd walk past them on the street today and not know who they were so with all due respect to billy ray cyrus and other people of equal academic standing um you know donald trump can't hear a criticism of him without there being a witch hunt or some kind of organized conspiracy against him right well it may just be more a reflection of his mindset than it is of the actual truth and no i don't recall seeing any serious peer-reviewed piece that proves that there is a conspiracy against trump um and in just the same way it, it, it it's a shorthand way of explaining you know if, if if the devil's conspiring against you, it might be a way of explaining that your bad luck is beyond your control. And it might be a way of not taking responsibility for it yourself. I mean, bottom line is that Miley Cyrus became hugely popular at a time when the internet was beginning to take popularity and fame into areas that nobody had previously experienced. You know, the whole thing about trolling is a fairly recent phenomenon and, um consequently it was a terrifying prospect and a lot of people to this day don't really understand it um and you your shorthand way of of understanding that and explaining it might be to go back to a a model of some kind of adversary that you can understand like satan yeah Um, if if we didn't have satan we'd need to invent him yeah no i I get exactly what you're saying there yeah that's that's a really great example uh, let's look at any more on here. So, uh, 
many comments about it being a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. There's many, many replies to say that. Uh, Dave Severe again says the PMRC uh, came a cropper when D. Snyder of Twisted Sister testified to Krug, testified to Congress. Uh, again, yeah, well, now that's a good point, and I didn't really want to go there, but like, can I just briefly mention that? Um, one of the points I made about moral majority groups or people who have serious concerns about evil or threats erupting, um, they, they work together when they feel that they have some agency. So the whole thing about the Tipper Gore was a good rallying point because somebody who'd got some political involvement, along with a lot of other people who'd got concerns, meant that they managed to get the you know, they managed to achieve some pressure. And if you've listened to the recent series of, of podcasts by John Ronson, for example, um, he talks to somebody who did a similar thing with um, Christians, Christians who were getting bothered about the way that education was going in America in the 70s. The One of the first targets they set to attack was librarians in schools, and they particularly went after the books that these people were presenting to kids to be read. So things like Catcher in the Rye became the touchstones. One thing that, and there's loads of historical examples of this time and time again, but, but one thing that often then destroys a particular mindset of people who feel that, that some evil is erupting, they, they misunderstand their enemies, yeah? So it never occurred to the PMRC that Dee Snyder, for, all, for what, whatever he looked like, that in, in the middle of that, you've got an articulate, intelligent person who's actually very much in control of what he does. Twisted Sister may not present that, but actually the most successful, um, the most successful cultish acts of all time often tend to, regardless of how they sound in music, they often tend to have a very similar setup that superficially, they're actually very disturbing. They're designed to alienate people. Underneath that, it's very easy once you once you become au fait with the kind of codes they use, it's very easy to understand that underneath that, there's a lot of intelligence at work. There's a lot of, you know, there's, there's the building of a relationship with the initiate audience. So actually, crudely, the biggest enemies of people like the PMRC actually behave a little bit like the PMRC. And, you know, the, moral majority groups often underestimate that. Um, I mean, to, to give you a simple example, because I'm, I'm assuming most people here would know, Motorhead, were a, I, I, me and my friends can't remember how many times we had an argument when Lemmy died about whether we'd seen him nine or 10 times, because we can't remember. But Motorhead were that animal, no pun intended, in spades. Um, there's, you know, hugely articulate ideas behind what that what, what you hear in the roaring wall of noise. Musically, they were actually very clever. The whole secret to the Motorhead sound is that they don't have a bass player. Lemmy might be holding a bass guitar, but he plays it the way Jimi Hendrix attacked a guitar, which means that the sound is absolutely full on. And most Motorhead fans <laughs> understood that. And underneath that, if you listen to songs like um, Just Because You've Got the Power, It Don't Mean You've Got the Right, you know, they're, they're making articulate statements for the underdog, which was exactly who their audience were. Um, and loads of people were just appalled at the, the sight and the sound of them, but they miss it completely. And a lot of the most extreme music, including Twisted Sister, that just plays with cultural norms about sexuality, is based on the same kind of thinking. Yeah, I, I get that, I get that. Uh, there's a question here from Sue. Uh, the band Ghost uses satanic imagery in its lyrics and stage show, but it's not intended to be taken seriously. It's a storyline built around the character the lead character plays on stage. So that, that evokes that sense that it is, it's, it's a performance and they are characters on stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's loads of those. I mean, um, yeah, and, and Alice Cooper is another one. I mean, he's basically, he's, he's arguably one of the most successful character actors in entertainment history, isn't he? Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he's, his wife still calls him Vince, doesn't she? <laughs> Possibly so. Possibly so. <laughs> Uh, Crowley is probably the best thing is the late decadence. Uh, Sorry, I'm just reading a comment here from Dave Sivir again. Uh, Crowley is probably best seen as a late decadent. If yeah, I'm reading, if I'm reading that correctly, yeah, I, I, really good point. Yeah, absolutely. So, in that sense, 
he's closer to the Bloomsbury set than you might think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just goes about it in a totally different way. Him, I, I, I mean, don't let's get into too esoteric territory, but him and Lytton Strake, he could probably high five each other and get what the other one was doing, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they're both worth a Google if you're unfamiliar with who they are. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a continuing statement, I guess, much what we're seeing here um, from Alice, which says that perhaps it's a lot of mentally uh, unwell people uh, playing their issues out through art. Um, I yeah. think and. and in some cases, it might be a good idea if somebody was helping them. But in other cases, it may well be that it's the best thing that they could do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Is I there mean, any more questions for anybody? It's, not, it's not, not the same thing, Christian, but I've heard Gary Newman talk very articulately about his Asperger's. Yeah. And make the point that of all the things he could possibly do with his working life, being Gary Newman is probably the best, you know. And so, in one, and it took him a long time to realise that. I mean, i.e., when he started, he didn't, you know, he just knew that he was different to everybody else, and that there were there were things about him that other people didn't seem to get. And by making that music, he suddenly found a bunch of like-minded people, um, and that was very helpful for a long time. And and obviously, as as we've become more aware of. Um, ASD and all related issues he's become a lot more self-aware um, and he's I'm not a huge fan but he's one of these people I kind of admire every time I hear him interviewed or when I see what he's up to you know I, I get totally why it works and why his fans love him yeah I, I get that too is there anyone else who wants to drop a question into the chat box now as we are about to round up as it is about 10 to 9 now CJ how are you feeling buddy are you, are you still there No, it's all quiet on the Eastern Front, as they say. Um, so should we draw this to a close now and yeah. uh, look forward to seeing you at uh, ASAP 40, which happens in about two weeks' time, three weeks' time? Yeah, I've, I've, and we're all, we're all presenting for half an hour then, aren't we? So I'm, I think I'm on and off you half an hour, at which point I'm really looking forward to meeting quite a few of the people that I've just seen in little boxes on the side when I've talked to you. Yeah, Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, many, many replies here. It's an amazing talk. Thank you very much. Uh, another great talk. So if we draw it to a close here and uh, we all look forward to high-fiving each other and giving each other talks, chats and beers on uh, September the 3rd and 4th, I look forward to seeing you all there. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out tonight, or for staying in tonight, rather. Yeah, and I'll, I'll see quite a few of you in September. Okay, that sounds like a great way to end it. So good night, everybody, and we shall see you next week.